your 4-4 lecture, we have the struggle for liberty, and we're going to be talking a, a lot about the the defeats and victories, and I know that's one of the blue section titles, but uh, the main or the, the bulk of, of the fighting, especially in the in the middle and northern colonies um, that are that are taking place. And so uh, as we go through this, remember that you're allowed to use these notes on your um, on your quiz, but you can also use it on your test at the end of the at the end of the chapter. Uh, so make sure that you have your notes ready and available and and kind of up to date. So um, four four, uh, the American Revolution, the struggle for liberty. Some of the stuff that we want to kind of keep track of and, and kind of remember is the strengths and weaknesses of of the the patriots and the British. Uh, remember that the the patriots have those intangibles, right? Um, the strengths that we had is we believed in what we were fighting for, right? We we have knowledge of the land, we have the belief, um, and, and that that core concept of of fighting to the death if if we have to. Um, the weaknesses that we had were the, the tangibles, right? We didn't have uh, as many soldiers. We didn't have the supplies. We didn't have the training. We didn't have the boats. Um, it's all the tangible things that the British had. They had the, a well-trained army. They had the largest Navy, um, the best equipped soldiers and, you know, basically in the world. And, um, the things that they struggled with were the, the cause, right? They were coming over, you know, a, a 10 to 12 week passage on a boat just to get over here. And then, some of the people that are using were mercenaries and we're only fighting for pay. So you see a big difference in, in how they were fighting and, and the conviction behind the fight. When we look at how different groups of people are going to uh, help uh, the Patriots uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at um, about African-Americans and, and women. Right. So Lord Dunmore's proclamation, and I know that the term is not in the book, but we do need to know Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Lord Dunmore <clears throat> at that time was a Virginia governor uh, who was appointed by the king. And he is going to make an announcement that any uh, slave who joins the British army will become free. So as the British go through the South, they will uh, they will allow and let those slaves know that all they have to do to join the, to be free is to join the British army. They, they will uh, get training. They will get a firearm. They will get, you know, everything they need and they will be able to fight against those people who oppressed them and, and held them and their ancestors in slavery. And so what we start to see is the um, British army recruit and, uh, and thousands of, former slaves actually joined the British army because of this. George Washington being in charge of the, the Continental Army had originally wanted to have free African Americans actually serve in the army. Um, when this came up though, Southern whites um, absolutely flipped saying, no, you cannot do that. And it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be shocking. You know, what scares a racist white guy is a black guy with a gun. And, and so what we, what we see is that Washington won't uh, allow uh, African-Americans to join the war, but then he starts to see how many thousands of uh, soldiers the British are getting and how short we are of soldiers. And so eventually he has no choice but to allow free African-Americans to join the war effort. And we will see, it. We will see thousands of free African-Americans uh, join the, the, the Patriots and then the Continental Army. And, um, it's a little bit different, but we do see them um, fighting alongside whites. It's it's really going to be the first time until um, I think it was Korea, it might have, late World War II, but maybe even Korea, where um, we have integration in the, of the army and fighting. So um, it, it is it is shocking for how uh, racial everything was at the time, but eventually Washington will allow free African Americans to join the join the revolution and fight for the Patriots. Um, for for the British and and I didn't have a really good spot of putting this uh, the British troops being easy targets because of having the red coats. Now those red coats do serve a purpose in battle. Uh, in an open field battle, you get shot in the shoulder, you get shot in the chest. Um, if you're wearing red, the blood doesn't show. And so if if you're shot in the arm, you can stand in the back and look like you're still reinforced. You you have more reinforcements and stuff. And so um, 
you, you do see a purpose of having those red jackets. Open field fighting is is a lot different than the way the Patriots are going to have to fight. Uh, the Patriots are going to fight behind trees and um, in more of a guerrilla warfare tactics. And we'll actually we, we talk about that in the in the next section. Um, but we have uh, the the. The red coats or the British are called red coats because of their their red coats. Uh, like I said, in open field fighting, it's it's a benefit. Um, but the style that we are we're trying to fight or the Patriots are trying to fight, uh, it's a detriment. It, it really is. Uh, in the forest, we're able to see them and it, they become easy targets. Um, so we know we know that uh, we do start to get African American support. Um, and joining the war effort after the uh, after Lord Dunmore's proclamation and um, Washington tries to counteract that. I will say this is a pretty good, I know this is a painting, but it's a pretty good photo bomb by this guy and even in a painting of George Washington. Um, but when it comes to women, women are also going to play a key role and, and not just by um, um, staying at home and taking care of everything at home as well. And, and I said this in class, and, and I truly believe this. One of the things that's completely short-sighted about men uh, when it comes to these times of war is that um, when men went off to war uh, during those times, it was the women who were having to do the husband's jobs and the wife's jobs uh, and her own job. Uh, and, and they always did it, and they always did it ex exceptionally well. Uh, and, and then the men would get home from war and think that women could do nothing but stay in the kitchen. And the reality is women can do everything. Um, and it's, it's not just staying at home and taking care of the kids. And we see this time and time again in, in warfare. And so the, the two women that your book talks about is Mary Ludwig Hayes, who's going to be known as Molly Pitcher, um, but also Deborah Sampson. And in, and in both cases, uh, both women are doing some pretty incredible things. Mary Ludwig Hayes is going to enter the battlefield and leave the battlefield several times a, a day in battles, uh, bringing water and food to the soldiers, especially the men uh, manning the artillery with the cannons. Uh, her husband was uh, loaded cannons. In one of the battles, he gets shot and wounded as he's taken off into the into the medic tent. She actually does his job in loading a cannon. Um, she doesn't just, you know, hide and start you know, not, and stops bringing water. She actually serves. She gets into the fight and, and helps with the artillery. Deborah Sampson is a, is a, I guess a, a revolutionary war kind of Mulan, uh, where she's going to dress as a man. Uh, she goes by the name of Robert Shirtliff. Uh, and in several after action reports, her, uh, commanding officer praises Robert Shirtliff for, uh, honorable actions and courageous duty in, in, in the battlefield. So um, not only does it show that women can fight in uh, in the front lines, but they can be successful and, and deserve accommodation for it. It's not surprising in today's society, or at least it shouldn't be surprising in today's society. Um, but Mary Ludwig Hayes and Deborah Sampson are great examples of how women can uh, or should be respected for all that they can do as well instead of just ignored now a lot of women at that time will be acting as messengers nurses spies and that um but this should you know just serve as an example of uh how in today even in today's society women are uh not having as much combat experience and it shows that they can uh, and they can be quite successful when we look at uh, other battles uh, it starts off, uh, it, it, the, the battles start off in, in, in really tough situations. Now, uh, when you're seeing the red and the blue, red is going to be British, blue is going to be Patriots. Um, and it starts off with, with Canada. And this is in December of 75. So this is uh, before the Declaration of Independence. Washington is still surrounding um, William Howe in, in Boston. Um Benedict Arnold is actually already captured. Uh, well, Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen have already captured Fort Ticonderoga. The guns are on their way back with Henry Knox. And then Benedict Arnold is given another job of getting a thousand men from uh, basically from Boston up to uh, up to Quebec. Now, as he's doing that, uh, Richard Montgomery is supposed to go from uh, basically New York straight up to Montreal and then over to Quebec. Uh, Montgomery has a much easier task than what bon Benedict Arnold does. Uh, Arnold needs to go through the thickest of forests throughout Maine. 
Um, and during that during that winter trip, he's going to lose 40 percent of his men, not by battle, not by anything else other than desertion. We're going to see 400 men leave Benedict Arnold's army out of the thousand. And we're going to think that he did a great job um, keeping 60 percent. So thinking think of taking a, a math test, scoring a 60 percent and your parents throwing you a party because of how great you did. Um, that's what we're talking about with Benedict Arnold here. Now, the reason why Canada becomes such a um, a controversy is because we're trying to figure out if we want to be offensive and try to gain territory, or if we want to be defensive in battle and or in war and and just make our supplies last longer. We don't have a lot of stuff, and so it's just one of those things that'll allow us to um, uh, keep our supplies longer. Well, we decided that uh, in December we want to try to make Canada the 14th colony. Uh, as Arnold and Montgomery eventually end up meeting up in in Canada, Arnold tries an attempt. It doesn't work, so he has to wait for Montgomery. Montgomery takes a couple weeks extra, um, and so the, the British have a better defense around Quebec. Um, they have city walls that go all the way around. Um, you can see them right here, at least, protecting the city as well. And then between... Uh, the the water and the city, there's more walls. The Arnold and Montgomery try to uh, make a evil genius plan or something where, hey, let's attack when they won't know. So um, they attack in the middle of a blizzard. Uh, it's, you know, in hindsight, it's completely not a good idea. Uh, you know, they were trying to be uh, tactical and, and, and use surprise. Uh, but the reality is the British didn't have to see where the soldiers were because there could only, they could only be between the walls and the water, walls and the water, and they just get shot. Uh, this attack in Canada is uh, just a, just an embarrassment, really. Um, Benedict Arnold will get more blame for this than what he deserves. Um, but it, it's because Richard, because Montgomery got shot and killed. There's no one else to blame. Um and so we we decide, okay, let's go defensive instead of being offensive with the failure of uh, of Canada in December of seventy five. Then remember the cannons get from Dorchester or from uh, Ticonderoga to Dorchester Heights in March of seventy six. William Howe is forced out of Boston on March seventh of sixty seventy six, and now Washington. So the Patriots control Boston. William Howe's embarrassed, and William Howe wants revenge against George Washington, and he gets it in New York. New York is in August of 76, and it's going to be a, a long march between August and February of Washington getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Um, but you have Washington just and, and the Patriots just get completely mobbed in New York. And, and part of this, the Hessians that we're going to talk about here in Trenton actually murder uh, about... I mean, just stab in the back and kill about 500 patriots in uh, while they're trying to surrender. And it's it's just a horrific, horrific scene for the Battle of New York. William Howe gets his complete revenge, takes control of, of New York. Washington is pushed off of Long Island, then off of uh, Manhattan Island, eventually completely out of New York uh, altogether. And then they end up having to settle in uh, the in Washington and, and the Patriots have to settle in uh, across the river from Trenton. Excuse me for the winter of uh, of 76 and 77. And we'll get to we'll, we'll get to that part in just a moment. Inside of New York, though, we do have people who are going to act as as spies. And and one of the most famous people is Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale is going to be from Connecticut. But he's going to be uh, uh, bringing secret documents out of New York by putting uh, the papers in the soles of his shoes. Uh, he actually cut open his boots, put the paperwork papers in the soles of his shoes. He gets caught with those, uh, and for being um, a traitor to the to the crown, he is going to be uh, executed. Uh, his famous last words are, "I regret, regret, but I have one life to give." for my country. And, and that goes back to that intangible of our people are willing to die for what they're fighting for. When, when the British soldiers, not necessarily they're better trained, everything like that, but they don't have the conviction that the, the Patriot soldiers do. And so Nathan Hale is an example of not only a spy being in New York, um, but the conviction that those, those people are, are, uh, are showing. 
When we get to the winter of 76, this is when we get into my favorite uh, motivational poster. Um, now, uh, and that's America. We will kill you. In, we will kill you in your sleep on Christmas. So Washington is struggling. We're down to uh, just a couple thousand men. Um, enlistments uh, are running out on, on December 31st. Uh, and, and this is where Thomas Paine is trying to encourage people by he writes in the American crisis, these are the times that tries men's souls, you know, the sunshine patriots and summer soldiers, that kind of, that, that kind of stuff. And, and just staying true to the cause and, and Washington is going to lead his men and his men, the men are going to love Washington. Uh, he, he never leaves them. He always fights for them and with them. Uh, and, and he devises a plan to try to attack the Hessians in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, uh, but he's going to do this in a strategic way that it's intelligent, not like Arnold and Montgomery attacking in a blizzard. Um, it's close. It's it's cold. It's all that. Uh, but Washington wants to attack uh, the Hessians at, uh, at at Trenton. Now, the Hessians are these hired foreign soldiers. Uh, they're from basically where Germany is now is really what it comes down to. Um, and and what we find out is that William Howe is staying in New York. And, and we talked about that in class that he's staying in New York because there's a specific, uh, it's Mrs. Loring who is there and he wants to stay with Mrs. Loring. There's parties, there's uh, plays, there's dances, there's, you know, everything there, everything he wants is in New York, um, including one of his officer's wives. Um, and so Washington, or so Howe stays in, uh, in New York while he sends the Hessians to watch Washington and Jersey. Um, so Washington wants to sail across the Delaware River uh, on the night of Christmas and attack on the 26th. And this is exactly what he does. Uh, on the night of the 26th, uh, him and his couple thousand men cross the river. They get into Trenton uh, early the next morning uh, and and attack. The Hessians are roused out of bed. They have uh, celebrated Christmas the day before pretty heavy. Uh, and so they're slow to get out of bed. The battle lasts less than an hour. Uh, and, and in less than that hour, there will be a thousand Hessian casualties, including over 900 captured. And there was only five casualties for the Americans. Five casualties in an hour of fighting. There's a thousand of their casualties and five of ours. Um, and that's just, it, it is just impressive on how well the plan worked. Uh, the only two deaths that happened from that were on the way home because of exposure. Men were walking. Um, it ends up being like a 10 or 12 mile march um, from the boat launch where they crossed the river at uh, to the town of Trenton. And so they had to march those 10 miles and then fight and then march those 10 miles back. Um, but through exposure, two men are going to die. Um, but it's not from battle, which is pretty impressive. So we went at the Battle of Trenton. Washington pushes his, uh, pushes it a little bit farther and attacks on January 2nd the, um, at the Battle of Princeton and wins there too. And, and so we have two very close uh, or two very important wins where it's different because this is where we start to see Washington go on the offensive. We tried to be defensive more in New York and it just, it was a failure. And so Washington's trying to push the luck a little bit and he gets offensive here in New Jersey and it is successful with that su success. It's um, late 76, early 77. So January, or sorry, December 26, 1776 and then January 2nd, 1777. No, you're not required to remember the dates. I'm just trying to go the chronology for you. So then we get to October, and in October is when Saratoga happens. Now, Saratoga is going to be important for a couple of reasons. Um, the biggest part, it's the turning point of the war. Um, we're going to Gates, uh, Horatio Gates, who wa him and Washington do not like each other. Um, and it gets, gets most of the credit um, for this victory at Saratoga when I'd say probably 80% of it deserves to go to Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold is uh, single-handedly going to charge between two artillery units. So he charges between two cannons being shot at him. Um, and he uh, takes down those two artillery units, which then allows the, the Patriots to win um, and then capture Burgoyne's entire army. Now, the side behind uh, the, the note behind that, though, is that um, Burgoyne was supposed to have support from Ledger and from Howe. Ledger never made it because uh, other Patriots throughout the area in New York were uh, cutting down trees. So Ledger never got there. 
uh, Burgoyne, Ledger, and, and how we're all supposed to meet in, uh, in Albany, New York. Um, and the only one who made it was Burgoyne. Burgoyne makes it, well, close. He gets to, uh, to Saratoga just north of it. Um, Ledger doesn't make it, but not his fault. How never makes it because how decides to change the plan. He make, he calls an audible. How goes to Philadelphia instead. And this is in October of 77. This is right before we get to the winter of Valley Forge. Um, but he captures Philadelphia, the largest city in, in America, the the capital of the, the colonists is where the Continental, Col- uh, Continental Congress is. Um, and so it is a very symbolic victory. Uh, but what it does is it leaves Burgoyne all by himself. And, and with that, Horatio Gates captures Burgoyne's entire army in October of 77. And the reason why it becomes a turning point is because now we're going to start to see foreign help. Now, before the before France and Spain, um, before this in October of seventy seven, France and Spain had um, helped us quietly. Uh, France had given us supplies, given us ammunition, but nobody knew about it. Um, we did get individual help. Lafayette, um, this young Frenchman, gives us two hundred grand of his own money, two hundred k in seventy six, seventeen seventy six, two hundred k. That's a chunk of change. Um, but he also serves in the army. He's a great commander. Uh, later on in the war in, in 81, he's going to actually um, basically help us trap uh, the the British at Yorktown. He, he's going to chase 6,000 British throughout the South and, um, and and get them to fall back into, into Yorktown. Von Steuben, I talked about, comes here because of uh, rumors of being gay. He's not going to be allowed to have... Um, uh, military advancement in Europe, and and he gets over here, and Washington doesn't care. He just wants a good person in charge uh, and, and to train our troops, and that's exactly what von Steuben does. Um, we don't care about the the, the reputation or, or the rumors that we're hearing about in, from Europe. We just want someone who can do the job, and, and von Steuben is phenomenal. Basically, our very first drill sergeant, he trains these troops at, at Valley Forge, and, and that's why when we leave Valley Forge, we have a well-trained army. It's because of Steuben. After the victory, like I said, in Saratoga, France and Spain now openly start to support us. Uh, Galvez, the governor of uh, of Spanish Louisiana, is going to start seizing ports uh, from Louisiana to Florida. He's going to uh, help influence the Native Americans in the, in the West to not fight against us. And he controls the Mississippi River, which the British are now not going to be able to use. Help from France is going to be that they're providing us money and, and and openly do this once they believe that we can win the war. So we do this with uh, the Patriots do this with help. They're outnumbered, they're outgunned, but they are going to get help from uh, from Lafayette, from Steuben, from Galvez, um, Kosciusko, um and um, Polanski as well. You, you see all these different people coming from different parts of the world, helping us in engineering and cavalry and drill sergeants in um, political stuff around the, the Gulf of Mexico and in serving and commanding in the army itself. It's all these different people coming together to help the Patriots win because they believe in the cause. Right now that winter at Valley Forge, like I was just saying is, it is brutal. Um, we go in uh, into this in, um, I'm trying to find the best spot for this. There we go. Um, we go into the winter. This is December of 77 to June of 78. Um, and we go in with 12,000 men. And out of the 12,000 men, only 10,000 come out. We're going to lose 2,000 men to no fighting. 2,000 men die of disease and malnutrition in, in uh, Valley Forge. The, the army lacked protection, supplies. They didn't have enough clothes, didn't have enough blankets, not enough food, not enough shelter. There's a smallpox outbreak. Washington has to go away, go around and try to figure out a way to inoculate all the soldiers. Um, and then we have to train them. And that's where Steuben comes into play. As the winter goes on, our men are going to be trained every day. Every day they go through this training on how to march into formation. It starts off with small groups of 10. Then they end up getting into uh, a little bit larger groups of 30, then 100, uh, and then eventually thousands, right? And, and Steuben gets them to be able to march in formation and travel in packs and be able to actually command in a fight the way in a real army should. And, and all of this success is because of Washington. Uh, Washington knows where to um, 
take advantage of, of his men's talents and lets them, lets them excel. And that's what Steuben does is he, he excels in organization and training. And, and that's what he does. He revolutionizes how the Patriots are trained. Coming out of Valley Forge in June of 78, we were in a much better situation in the war. Um, and we continue to talk about that in section five. The last section here is talking about the war in the West and the war in sea. Um, the war at sea is, is really one of those things that we don't have an army or, or sorry, we don't have a Navy in, in, in February of 76, we have, uh, the Patriots have eight ships. The eight ships that they have are all, uh, all, uh, merchant vessels. So they're basically business ships. So take a UPS truck and turn it into a military, uh, vehicle. And that's what they did. Um, it was the Patriots fleet was way too small to fight in the battles. And so, uh, the Patriots are going to allow pirates to, to help us out. And the best pirate pirate we have is John Paul Jones. Uh, he was born in Scotland. Um, but he's going to eventually get command of uh, a small fleet. Uh, France gives him seven vessels to, to command. Um, his flagship is the Boheme Richard and it goes up against the Serapis. And this is where, um, early on in the battle, the Serapis, the British, the British ship, the Serapis is going to, uh, take advantage and actually dominate the Boheme Richard and, uh, asks, are you ready to surrender? John Paul's response is I have not yet begun to fight. Uh, John Paul Jones knows that if he's captured, he will be executed because of all of the raids that he's done on British vessels. Um, so he, he'd rather, uh, die fighting, then surrender and die. Uh, he wins that battle and he continues to go through. And as, uh, as we look at the, uh, as we look at the war at sea, the U S Navy is less than a hundred ships by the end of the war. And they are going to be able to sink more than 200 British vessels because of the use of pirates. It is completely, um, counterintuitive really. Um, but the, the plan of attacking, uh, uh, supply ports and supply ships is, is brilliant. Uh, we can't go toe to toe against the war vessel, uh, the, the, um, yeah, the war vessels. So let's attack the supply ships and it, it is very effective. The war in the West is very similar. Uh, George Rogers Clark is going to be, uh, the person who takes control of our stuff in the West. Uh, he surveyed the Ohio and Kentucky River, so he knows the land very well. Um, he's actually got some relationships with the Native Americans because it's the American Indians who control lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. They control all this red area. We don't have a lot of soldiers or uh, settlers out there. And the Native Americans, that's where they're at. Sorry. The Native Americans are going to be much more um, receptive to British um, support because the British are going to bribe them. And the way that, um, the way that George Rogers Clark wants to upset that is by taking away the, the trading ports or sorry, trading forts, uh, that the British have in the West. So, um, Washington or so Clark is going to go through and capture three main forts in the West, uh, Kaskaskia, Cahokia, uh, and Sackville as he captures those. Uh, the Native American support for the British are going to wane because they're not able to bribe them as as effectively. Uh, and, and so we see this strategy of attacking supply ports, supply ships, and those trading ports, uh, tra the trading ports, those are going to be effective strategies in, those, in the sea in the West. We can't go toe to toe. We just don't have the manpower. We don't have the force to do it. We have to do something else. It's stick and move, stick and move. Right. Um, it, it's not to stay in close and just get into a slug fest. It is hit and run away. And, and that's what we're going to do. This becomes very successful for us and for the Patriots. Um, and, and we see coming out of the winter of Valley Forge, a much better, uh, chance of victory is coming out uh, after Saratoga help from foreign support winter of Valley Forge, our soldiers get trained and now we're getting into, uh, much more success. Okay. Good luck on your quiz. Uh, make sure you have your notes set up for your test at the end of the, at the end of the chapter.